everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. We're really excited today to be here with a special bonus episode where we are going to be talking with director Tor Freudenthal. And we were able to interview, uh, have an interview with Zach, uh, our friend of our podcast about the movie Words on Bathroom Walls. And, uh, and Tor is the director of that film. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Absolutely, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so what we've been doing lately is just been asking our guests to, to tell us how have you been handling this time of quarantine, this kind of crazy time? Have you been doing any uh, quarantine baking or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could bake. Um, you know, we're just so, sort of sequestered at the house. Um, we have a, a two and a half year old, so he, oh. he keeps us on our toes. Yeah, do um, it. You know, doing a bunch of reading, you know, uh, exercising. I love to run. So, you know, I do that to, to stay sane. Um, here in Los Angeles, we had these these fires that yeah. are still ongoing. So um, we sort of took that as an opportunity to get out and take a needed vacation. So we went to Arizona mm. for like 10 days where the air was clear and it was beautiful. Um and that was nice to to get away. Um, so other than that, just you know, reading, watching stuff, yeah. trying to unsuccessfully tune out the news as much as possible. Um, <laughs> Have you binged anything good? Um, yes. Um, so my favorite thing probably this year. Uh, was a show on Hulu made by the BBC. It's called Normal People. Oh, I know um, that. I, it, it's it's incredible. Um, it's 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 a it's a simple love story, uh, beautifully acted. Um, I can highly recommend it. it. You know, if you're missing some sort of human interaction and you know emotional closeness, this will give it to you. Uh, mm. It's it's beautiful. Cool. That yeah. sounds that sounds really good. Have did you watch McMillions? I have not. Oh no. So good. That's my yeah. favorite. Of all the things that I binged, that was my favorite. And on, maybe on, it was because it's the first thing that I binged during right. quarantine. Right. But it's so entertaining. <laughs> it's a docu-series, but it's gotcha. really good. I I also currently uh I'm watching The Vow. Not a particularly oh, yeah. lighthearted thing, <laughs> but it's it's magnetic. I mean, yeah. you can't you can't turn your eyes from it. They're it's good at really, doing that. Really well done yeah. on on HBO and yeah. and, and uh, Netflix. Uh, well, so we had uh, talked just briefly before, and you had told me that you actually started out with uh, with your studies in animation. Yes, uh, and I know that you're you're a uh, you're a big lover of animation. Huge, um, huge animation uh, fan. I've been a writer over at rotoscopers.com for uh, for five years. Oh, very uh, cool. I, and I, over on my other content, I talk all about animation. So that was very exciting for me. You even yeah. studied at CalArts. I did, yeah. That's uh, so cool. Yeah, the, the, my first love really as a kid was drawing. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. Uh, I I grew up in in Berlin in Germany, so I, I I fell in love with this sort of French Belgian comics, you know, like Tintin like or Tintin and yeah. Asterix. Later on, when I was a little older, you know, I I absolutely adored uh, Mobius. Uh, the artists still do. So I I was really I thought I was going to be a maker of graphic novels. Um, so I drew like crazy. My dad's a visual artist and a, and a painter. So I, you know, I was surrounded by that and he taught me a lot about art and art history and we drew a lot together. Um, and I was making comics. So when I was a teenager in high school, I was able to like sell some of these short stories, maybe five or six pages long to magazines. Um, and that was sort of, that's where my heart was. I, I was watching films, but I didn't consider it back then as a thing to do. I didn't know how to do it. 
Um, but when I started becoming more interested, the first thing I turned to because I was drawing was animation. So uh, the art school I went to didn't have an animation class or someone to teach me how to do it, but they did have this like Oxbury camera, the old animation stand uh, type thing in a basement. And so I, I read books, you know, there's a, I think it was like Preston Blair or something. And then a book by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, The Illusion of Life. So I, I, I tried to sort of teach myself of how to do it. And I made a couple of short films, which then led to getting accepted um, to Cal Arts. So I moved across the Atlantic <laughs> and my life completely changed. You know, I was Gosh. suddenly in California. Uh, it was really, it was an exchange program I got into and the plan was to stay one year. And I loved it so much um, that I just stayed mm -hmm. and, you know, got out of school, um, worked. By that time, I sort of, it, it was an ongoing long and winding road of discovery of what I wanted to do and things fell by the wayside. I sort of, through learning animation at CalArts, I really got this, you know, the basics of storytelling back then in film, but also maybe intuitively understood that I, I was not gonna be great at sitting at a desk by myself for a long time, you know? Mm -hmm. Animation is a very sort of, um, very, very detailed, kind of um you know labor intensive process um yeah. and i knew years. yes yes uh and i knew i didn't really want to be sort of an animator or maybe work at a giant company where you know you're you're lucky to you know do a little part of the storytelling maybe and over long long a long period of time I've, I've seen friends of mine who I graduated with go through that process mm -hmm. uh, it takes a while a long while until you get to tell your own story if ever you know mm -hmm. so um but what I did learn what's amazing about animation and the reason I think animated movies on average are so good is that they're essentially there's a trial and error process they're, they're they are mostly sort of made or they're edited before they're made, you know? So you get to throw sequences up in chicken scratch and, you know, realize they don't work and then take them down and start from, start anew. So that's why I think these, the, you know, movies made by Pixar or Disney are so watertight yeah. on average. Um, well, the whole and, idea of the brain trust yeah. and uh, things getting perfected over years because most movies are made in a couple of as far as the shooting of it is made in a couple of a couple of months yes. and uh if weeks if you're talking you know made for tv movies and uh whereas uh you know animated films take years yeah. uh to make and so it's a different thing and and people might not that aren't a kind of up in the animation scene might not realize that cal arts has produced practically every big name yes. animator yeah. uh, that uh, people like Alex Hirsch, who did Gravity Falls, mm -hmm. uh, Gendy Kartikoski, uh, Craig McCracken, who did Powerpuff Girls. I mean, just the list goes on and on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it was it was a beautiful experience going there. The teachers were amazing. Also, that feeling that everybody was sort of in love with the same thing and pulling in the same direction. So mm -hmm. that the, you know, if there if there was competition, it was always really founded in, you know, the adoration of the medium mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, inspire each other to be better at it. And it's just such an amazing time to be an animation fan because I mean I, I've thought about it a lot that in, in the eighties, I mean, there were years where they didn't have a single animated film, zero, not one right. released, which is crazy. And, you know, and, and you'd have, uh, so, you know, one or two maybe. And, and we regularly have, you know, 30 <laughs> 
I right. mean, films released. Absolutely. I mean, it's just amazing. And that's not even including all the television work. It's just, uh, people have nostalgia for, you know, for the, for the old animated television shows. But in my opinion, I think it, it's, it's just getting better and, and better and better. And I mean, just in my opinion, even something like you look at the new DuckTales versus the old DuckTales, it's mm-hmm. way better. <laughs> I right. Think. I also I think it's like it's getting narratively and stylistically more diverse and maybe oh, yeah. thanks to, you know, places like Netflix mm-hmm. um, who are taking chances with some adult sort of driven mm-hmm. content. I remember like at CalArts, Brad Bird came to talk to us um, one year and he, he and I, I'll never forget this, he said, you know, animation is not a genre. Right. Shouldn't be seen as a genre, meaning the kids genre. To right. him, it was a medium in which to tell stories. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's shown that time and again that, you know, you can, you know, deal with, you know, even in a, in a sort of comedic sense with adult themes. Yeah. And I think now he's, he's working on something that's, that's more adult driven, which I hope mm-hmm. gets made. That would be amazing. Yeah. I mean, you look something like Bojack Horseman, uh, oh, I love as that. an example yeah and uh, there's a, a lot of uh, more mature animation that's that's coming out and being received well and and uh, so it's it's a really exciting time to be an animation fan and uh, and it's kind of cool in the you know age of of this crazy year that uh, that animation is when everything was closed animation was one of the things that could keep going forward yes and we could keep working on it uh within reason not every part of it of course but uh, right. but uh but yeah it's uh it's it's kind of they even had a the the show the blacklist they mm-hmm. i guess they even had the um final we couldn't film the final episode of the season so they they ended up doing an animated wow i did yeah, not know that what because, a great idea <laughs> yeah which is really cool that's cool and, uh, so anyway yeah uh, we could talk the entire podcast just about all this geeky animation probably, stuff probably yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> um but you had your first feature at least according to imbb though what i saw was hotel for dogs and that seems like a pretty big feature like yeah. for your first one to not have to do some like you know obscure indie kind of a thing like that's well my cool. my obscure indies were I guess commercials and short films like I mm-hmm. you know what I did out of Cal Arts is I I got a job um basically working as a concept artist doing everything from um storyboards to you know working for set design to designing characters um and i did that for a couple of years and did short films along the way like little spec pieces which got me ultimately into commercial directing so i was signed mm. uh to the roster of a commercial production house and that was you know my second film school really you know i, I had you know I learned a lot of theoretical stuff working on big movies uh, within the context of my first job, but never actually, uh, you know, directed on the floor. Um, and that's what commercials sort of did for me. I, I directed probably for like four or five years. I did stuff in Europe. Um, I worked in the United States. So I did, you know, Campbell soup, Nike, mm-hmm. you know, Foot Locker and, you know, Florida's natural orange juice, like Mm -hmm. you name it. And it was very educational. It doesn't really equip you. It doesn't, it doesn't teach you long form storytelling at all. But what it did for me was like, you know, get, help me get a handle on working with a crew to, you know, keeping a timetable, being responsible in the eyes of the agency and the the client you work with, which is really like, you know, it's almost like a producer studio situation if you translate it to studio filmmaking. And I made a I made a short along the way that went to Sundance. So all the the combination of that work got me into rooms with people on a studio level to talk about films. And there were a couple of like false starts, but then yeah, Hotel for Dogs came around. It was a matter of like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, like, give me a movie to do, you know. 
um, mm -hmm. maybe a different mindset that I'm in today, but it was a wonderful maiden voyage. The studio was DreamWorks, um, mm -hmm. which is now Amblin Partners. And it was a great, great experience. You know, got to cast some wonderful actors like Don Cheadle and Lisa Kudrow and a very, very young Emma Roberts. Mm -hmm. And I was still sort of trying to figure out how to tell a story, honestly. Like, yeah, I mean, they say never, you want to avoid working with animals and avoid working with kids. And you did <laughs> both. both for your first yes, time. yes. <laughs> and it, you know, that there's different, there's different difficulties. The animals were incredible, meaning mm -hmm. their sort of symbiotic relationship with the trainers were uh, just mind boggling. The one thing I had to do is make a lot of decisions in advance of how, what I wanted the dogs to do and how we could communicate emotions because there was no cg it was all there was no talking mm -hmm. animals you know or or you know manipulating their faces at all it was just them mm -hmm. and that's why you know i had to sit down with trainers maybe three weeks in advance and say well this scene what can we do to convey you know sadness in this dog and they made suggestions like you know he could put put his head or chin down to his paw and look up, you know, things like that, Is it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then you say, okay, let's, let's do it like this. And then they need a couple of weeks to acclimate the dog, to make the dog get used to the idea of what he does in the scene. And then once the day came around, we did the scene, it was, you know, it, it, it worked really well. They were, they were amazing. Yeah. Whereas the, and they can work longer than, the minors, the human minors, meaning the, the children in the yeah. film, which, you know, labor laws dictate, obviously, that you can't have them, depending on age, either past six hours or eight hours. So it was a good exercise in like telling the story and sometimes telling the story really quickly um, with the time that I had. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah. interesting. Uh, so then you did Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and that must have been fun because there is animation in that. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I was really in love with these books. Um, and when I sort of talked with the producers, um, Nina Jacobson and Brad, uh, Simpson, who made the movie, uh, with me, I had actually sort of, because I was drawing as a kid, I had sort of done my own diaries of a wimpy kid in a way, like mm -hmm. they were not as much like the Greg Heffley diaries in the movie, which recount day-to-day, -day, you know, happenings in school and life. They were sometimes verging into sort of fantastic, the fantastical, but I was always drawing and writing stuff. Um, and I brought these like, books to these diaries to our meeting. Cause I was like, there definitely is a parallel, you know, uh, between sometimes, you know, uh, having this outlet of drawing and working through stuff on the page that you, that I wasn't able to do maybe in my, in my day-to-day -day life. So I could, I could relate to that um, in the film. And we, you know, we had, the challenge of that movie was that the books are very episodic, if you will, you know, this hap one day, this happens, the next day, this happens. And we, we were, working to make this a story about a kid who makes a number of very wrong decisions and then you know in, in the course of it loses his best friend and has to has to see the error of his ways and and get him back so it was it was a more sort of you know it had a had a more pronounced story arc than maybe the books but we we tried to definitely get the feel of the books in there and the animation cutting to his diary and even doing things like direct address to the camera which you know i did again in words uh, on bathroom walls in a very very different way all that sort of helped you know i guess bring bring the character or create a direct line between the character and the audience mm -hmm. yeah i enjoyed it i i think that we don't get enough live action quality films for kids, mm -hmm. particularly for like a little bit older kids. I feel like there's a lot of stuff that's 
for teenagers and there's a lot of stuff that's for little little kids Mm -hmm. but uh, that sort of in between phase I feel like they're kind of either they end up liking stuff that's maybe a little too old for them or like, you know, there's yeah. stuff that's too young. And so I, I appreciated that about the wimpy kid movies and uh, that, uh, you know, we just, there's a lot of animation, but just having a live action story that, that about a kid they can relate to, I think is cool. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, so let's talk about Words on Bathroom Walls. This is the recent release. Uh, and uh, so I, when I went and saw it, I knew nothing about it. I just was anxious to get back in the theater and I was able to go, go safely. Uh, and I really, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well done. I, I'm a big uh, advocate, I guess, for trying to remove the stigma that we have about mental illness and that we're unwilling to talk about it, that we're embarrassed about it. All that stuff is just so frustrating to me. And so this movie really struck home to me. And so I really appreciated that you made it. And, um, and I, I, when I wrote my review, uh, I, you know, I said, I'd love to know how this, feels and how how it's responded how somebody with schizophrenia responds to it because i have no way of knowing that i'm just guessing and uh, so then zach he uh he emailed me and he really liked my review and he liked the movie and so he came on and i'll put a link down to that interview in the description uh but uh anyway it's just been a really great experience uh hearing his ex- his experience and how much he loved the movie and so i think he you all have a lot to be uh, very proud of with it. Well, thank you so much. I mean, Rachel, this interview was amazing for me to hear. Um, in the last couple of weeks since the film's come out, I've gotten messages uh, you know, from people who either have a family member suffering from the illness or you know, are themselves um, people with schizophrenia and you know a lot of them say they feel really great about being respected or being seen and for this film to not use this illness as a means to (laughs) create cinematic suspense or danger or fear exactly like our main goal was always in making this movie to show the person behind the illness um and and be respectful of them and empathetic to them and here's so here's why this listening to um zach talk about his experience with it in in detail is so meaningful this film was made with a lot of love by a lot of people you know Mm -hmm. we we immersed ourselves in this subject matter um we had you know during the making of it you know more than one medical advisor on board who you know went through the script and gave us pointers or suggestions uh you know i talked with therapists who deal with youth with schizophrenia specifically you know and work with with those patients i talked with families who have to live with a diagnosis because so much of the film is a is about how it affects our lead character's relationships within mm-hmm. the family unit, which he sees as being, you know, fraught and, uh, you know, circumstances. If you see the movie, you know, he finds he he himself is in, in danger or being challenged. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of sort of testimonials you can find or people with the illness talking about their experience. Um, um, it, it, I read a couple of books, one of which I really want to recommend. It's called The Center Cannot Hold uh, by a woman named uh, Ellen R. Sachs, who also has a TED Talk on the subject. She's kind of one of the success stories um, of of a person living with schizophrenia. She's a tenured law professor at USC, and she's lived with this through most of her adult life, really. And the book goes into great detail about her psychosis episodes she's had, um, 
and also how it, it has affected her friendships. Um, and that that book was so educational for anyone who wants to know, learn more mm. about this, uh, pick it up. Um, you know, I had a nice little email exchange with her before I made the movie. And then after it was done, she watched it and very graciously uh, um, made herself available to interview two of my cast members, Charlie Plummer and, and Molly Parker. You can find that, I think, on the Facebook page of the film. Um, my point is, though, that even with this knowledge and all the, the information, at the end of the day, I had to make a sort of creative choice of how to portray this in an accessible way in a in a audiovisual creative medium, essentially. It's yeah. a storytelling medium. And portray this illness, the symptoms of which are about as manifold and varied as the human brains on this planet, you know? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's sort of a decision going out on a limb of making certain sort of aesthetic choices of how you show this illness in a way that is an invitation to keep watching and to understand it even for completely uninitiated people and get on board. And this is the most important thing emotionally always be invested in what happens with Adam and, and understand what he's going through. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a conceit. It's a, it's our version of it or our interpretation of it, if you will. And because of that, it felt really gratifying to hear Zach you know, talk about how he connected with it and that it, you know, essentially um, does, you know, does a service to opening minds and, you know, yeah, and at least being a conversation starter. Um, yeah, it's really, yeah. it's the, like the powerful nature of art. That's why we need to, like, we really need to fight to keep theaters. We need to keep uh, them, you know, going because uh, this, the whole transformative process of from the filmmaker all the way down to the viewer, to the mm -hmm. critic, cr to the critic, to all the different people involved, uh, it, it changes who you are. And I was actually talking, I was emailing with Zach the other day, and he said that now he's feeling so encouraged that he's going to start up a blog about his experiences. And so this is just, wow. it's just so exciting. I'm, that I love is amazing. It. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. Uh, I mean, like, as I said, when I retweeted your podcast, I was like, this is exactly the, the conversations yeah. we need to be having in a very, in a, in a destigmatizing, open way. So I, if the movie can contribute a little bit to making that happen, I'm, you know, we've, I'm, I've, we've done our job. Yeah, I think you know? so. Yeah. Well, so what was, what was it like as far as casting in the movie? So mm -hmm. you have Charlie Plummer as the lead and I, he's somebody, I just absolutely loved Lean on Pete uh, yeah. the film he had previously done and uh so he's somebody that's been on my radar and uh i i've i've said you know flying time that i think he's kind of the the next um leonardo dicaprio uh, <laughs> I, was, I, think, I was gonna say the same thing yes uh, a lot of people a lot of people during the shoot saw those they saw that parallel yeah. i um, think he's super talented and uh so uh how did you end up getting to cast uh charlie so I had seen Lean on Pete as well and another movie called King Jack um, that he did when he was even younger. Um, and then, of course, the, the Ridley Scott movie, uh, All the Money in the World. Mm -hmm. So it was very clear when our partners on the movie, LD Entertainment, who are Mickey Liddell and Pete Shillamon, basically said, we're making this, um, that we were not going to make it with if we couldn't find... A, uh, an actor who could embody all these different sides of Adam kind of seamlessly. I mean, this is a, this is a tough acting job, you know, because hmm. he, he has, for Charlie, throughout the shoot, it was a roller coaster because the shoot is very fast. I think we did this in like 25 days or something. And he, he, you know, 
he was up one day and down the other, you know, because the, the movie is a roller coaster now, you know, imagine you have to act it all out. You know, there's, there's a lightness sure. to the movie. Um, there's, you know, Adam in his more sort of tender, relaxed moments. And then there's, you know, a, a sort of descent into psychosis. So, you know, I, I just feel incredibly lucky to have gotten Charlie to do this. We sent him the script. Um, at that point, there was no audition process for him. And I think he read it over the weekend and it signaled his interest. And I had a conversation with him over uh, Skype. And then he, you know, we saw eye to eye and off we went. Um, the thing about him is like, as a director, you you have certain, you can't help but have, have the movie in your head in a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and what was refreshing about Charlie is like with all my planning and all our discussions, at the end of the day, I was more surprised than not sometimes at his choices. Um, there was one particular thing I'll never forget. Um, there's a scene, and I don't want to spoil it, but uh, towards the end of the, the second act where he is having a, he's, he's having a very heated argument with his parents um, and certain things start to happen in the room that signal to us that, you know, this is not, you know, 100% the reality that everybody else sees or in his head. So when I rehearsed the scene with him and the actors and sort of blocked it out, meaning determining the movement of the scene, mm -hmm. he almost didn't do anything in rehearsal. It was always like, uh, you know, he had a quiet mutter at best when he said his dialogue. And I realized, oh, he's, he's just warming up or he's not, he's not sort of spending himself on the rehearsal. And then once the camera rolls, it was like, oh my, like Charlie Plummer, the, 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 the hurricane tornado. And it was at that point where as a director, I turned into kind of an audience member you know, of like experiencing his interpretation of that. And I'll, I'll never forget it. And it's like, it teaches you to, you know, hold the reins very steady, but also, you know, give room and let, you know, let them, let them sort of bring themselves to it yeah, trust and surprise you. Exactly. And all the actors did that. Like I, I, I it's, it's a project where I, in, in in the acting department, I don't see a weak link. I, I was, I was, you know, we did our due diligence, obviously, with casting. But then once you see the whole ensemble kind of work together, you're like, you know, hallelujah, it's working. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. uh, so the next question will be, admittedly, kind of spoilery. So if people mm. listening want to skip ahead, uh, they they might want to do that. But <laughs> um, so I have to ask. To me, the most impactful moment of the movie was when he reads the letter from Walden Goggins, his stepdad, mm -hmm. um, when he reads that letter that, that he wrote to the school. And did you cast Walden Goggins kind of specifically knowing this was going to be against type because because it, it was because he has played so many villains. Right. And so for the fact that he ended up being a good guy and wrote that letter was such a surprise. Yes. That was not what I was expecting. And it was so moving to me that, that, that just reading that darn letter, I, I really <laughs> liked that part. <laughs> Thank um, you. Well, and so, yeah, was that kind of by design? It was by design. And, and in that case, I have to thank uh, my amazing casting director, John Papsidera, who, you know, we discussed different options for Paul and he brought up Walton. And then I sort of intuitively saw the idea behind it because through most of the film, we see Paul or we, we experience Paul through Adam's eyes. Yeah. So Paul, Paul is more like an image really that Adam creates. And when that image sort of falls apart and gives way to who the real person is, um, you know, it, it, it worked so well as a prize because of, 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 of Walton, you know, it, it, the other thing is too, that the character is very insecure. If you look back at, you know, after you've, you get the reveal and you watch mm -hmm. you know, to the end of the movie 
it's very clear that Paul is someone who doesn't know how to deal with this situation very well. And the letter is a way, you know, he wrote a letter. He didn't spoke out loud. You know, he, he didn't, he didn't feel secure enough to sort of, um, but it was really, a letter re- that was in defense of, of him, of his son yeah. and him claiming him as his son yes. and defending him for these people that had rejected him. And so yes. it was even more than just like if say he'd written him a letter uh right. in the, right. the the fact that he was defending him as his son i thought it was just really good yeah thank you add and to it, that also like what i wanted to do is have the letter and this is very spoilery obviously um have the letter be read while charlie you know first he understands and then he just gets up and starts running and the word Walton's words combined, I think with the, just that like sort of determined, you know, forward motion, this sort of forward pressing of the character that runs downstairs and runs through halls and, and doesn't stop until he's with Paul. There's something sort of, I guess, inherently moving about the, that motion to me. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, it's not really outlined in the book that way, but that's, that's the way I sort of wanted to stage it because I think like (laughs) running almost has, has, is a cinematic equivalent, maybe to singing. It's like expending energy, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's as if like the shackles have come off, the emotional shackles have Mm -hmm. come off of Charlie and he now knows, you know? So I think that all Mm -hmm. sort of worked well in unison together i think so too uh so you had when he's experiencing uh the multiple personalities you had uh it would be sort of sort of a a black fog Mm -hmm. and i was wondering how you kind of came up with that yeah i mean and, and it's it's not really multiple personalities because this is not multiple personality disorder it's sort of giving a sort of filmic physical manifestation to the voices that um, people with schizophrenia hear. Most of the symptoms are, you know, uh, auditory. Uh, Some are visual, so we had that to sort of lean on. But um, the the black sort of fog, I sort of saw it. the, the sort of origin story, I guess, where the, 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 the first psychotic break, as Adam puts it, happens in a chemistry class yeah. uh, in, in his public school. And they're working with like dissolving liquids in water, which is actually sort of real in the scene if you listen to the teacher. So there is a, there's black ink dissolving in water and he's looking at it and once the voices sort of overtake him, which I always interpreted as um, part of the sort of stress trigger of maybe being shut out at home, of you know feeling that Paul is taking his place um, at home. It sort of you know uh, gets out of hand, and I felt that maybe that the, the chemistry class and the visual of that was a nice little. Um, visual recurring theme we could use to give, you know, to visualize the the voice he's hearing because it's the only one that is not embodied by an actor and as such is a little bit more undefined and, you know, nefarious, if you will. So that's where that came from really mm. is the, 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 this chemical exercise they're, they're doing in class. Okay, that makes sense. That was really good. I liked it. Um, so yeah, you have the the personalities depicted in the uh, in the film. You have uh, bodyguard, darkness, uh, and uh, you have oh, Rebecca okay. and Joaquin. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess though that was were those in the book that way? Yes, they were. So Rebecca was in the book. Um, you know, um, the bodyguard was like sort of more of a mobster. We, we sort of, we changed them a little bit from the book. There's also a lot more in the book. Like there's a, there's even a, I think a choir in the book that, that sort of 
sings at very inopportune times in his mm. life. So um, we felt more like it was beneficial to the movie to pare this down a little bit and, and use it sparingly and hopefully effectively. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we did. They were, they were, they were in some shape uh, in the book and we just kind of reduced them down a little bit. There's, a, I think there's a, there's a naked man in the book who is sort of, you know, who is very, very inappropriate. And yeah. we morphed him a little bit into Joaquin, you know, the, who represents the sort of hormonal urges uh, <laughs> of, of Adam. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with this obviously is like, as I said, you know, we needed to give the, the illness a face or a something we could film, you know, something yeah. that is like concrete, you know, um, that also weaves it through the scenes like a character itself, you know, and that that's the port that supports the notion of, of what Adam has to deal with. So, um, you know, they, they sort of disappear and reappear depending on how he's dealing emotionally with and, and with his medication and so forth. Um, yeah. I think it worked. I really enjoyed it. And I admire uh, Anna Sophia Robb. I feel like she takes really interesting projects and yeah. uh, for her to take uh, this role, I in, know. you know, just a secondary role. I, privilege I, for us yes yeah i thought that yeah. was really cool yeah she i mean she along with the others you know uh sort of popping in and out really managed to create a character with uh not a whole lot of material on the page mm -hmm. um give her depth and dimension and um you know character beats that you you know shortly after you meet them you sort of know what they're all about, but then they continue to surprise you and how, with their interactions and how they respond to whatever's happening with with um, with Charlie. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed the film, and I really it's definitely it's been a very special experience working with Zach and they're getting to talk to you. Uh, so thank you very much for coming and talking with us and. Uh, and uh, for sharing your experience and we'll be excited for any new projects that you have coming up and you have to keep yeah. in touch and and let us know I what will. you have you so uh, much. Yeah. what you have coming up that would be thank great you, rachel it's 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 been fun thank you uh, do you have social media that you'd like to share or anything like that i have a twitter account which is my first and last name um you can check that out other than that um, I don't have Instagram. Maybe I should have it, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm on Facebook as well, um, which is more sort of a, you know, a private account, really. But you can probably see it. Um, well, I'll put your Twitter uh, in the uh, in the description. I'll also have in the description the like the interview with Zach and also my written review. So make sure everybody check that out. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, the movie you said is coming to digital in November? Yeah, from what I hear, um, Lionsgate is putting it out, um, I think November 10th, but double check on streaming. Uh, and then uh, Blu-ray and DVD, I think November 17th, mm -hmm. uh, shortly thereafter. Yeah. So definitely take a look at it and let us know after you see it, what you think, if you like it. I uh, put in the comments section or on Twitter. Let's talk about it. And uh, thanks again. Really appreciate it. And make sure you're all following the Homeworkies podcast all over social media, iTunes, YouTube. And uh, if you're listening on the iTunes, please leave us your ratings and reviews. And if you are listening on YouTube, please uh, give this uh, video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We sure appreciate that so much. We also have our paging group and merch store. So all that information is in the description. You can follow me at Rachel's Reviews, all over social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. You can see all my reviews over there. So thanks again, Tor. I really appreciate this. This was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all later. Bye, Bye. everyone.